All right, great. So I'm, I'm going to kick off today. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Joella Lampman, and I am the School and Turfgrass IPM Educator with the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. And I'm just really happy uh, that you're all able to join us today for this virtual conference. Uh, every year we hold an annual conference and it's on different topics. And this year um, we wanted it to be focused on school IPM, mostly because we wanted to take advantage of Len Braben's being, being with us. And, and he's a, a giant in school IPM across the nation, not just here statewide. And he retired in May. So, um, when we had to postpone the in-person conference and move it to virtual, we're really excited that he uh, agreed to hang out with us for a few more months so uh, he could help us to put this together and also to offer you your expertise. And he's gonna be one of our speakers today. Uh, I also wanna thank Cornell Agritech and the National Institute for Food and Agriculture within the USDA, uh, whose funding is helping to put this conference together. So I just want to say that our plans to have this conference last April uh, was derailed due to COVID-19. Uh, but this current focus on school health and safety provides a really ideal if unanticipated backdrop uh, for this rescheduled uh, conference. So as you're going to hear, pests and pest management within schools can directly impact students, teachers, staff, and, and the community at large, and equally, there are pest issues like bed bugs and German cockroaches that schools are unable to prevent from coming in and they need to have that more uh, community large intervention. We don't have the answers, so that's partly why we put together this conference and we're really looking for your input as well. So we hope that you will be engaged through the chat box, in the panel discussion um, that we're going to have after the formal presentations. Uh, that you'll be willing to share and have conversations. And then next uh, week, we're also going to have small group conversations to address some of these issues. So we're going to start off with formal presentations by our speakers. Uh, then we're going to take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and, and we'll open up that panel discussion and hopefully uh, you'll be able to be involved in that. So um, welcome. We are glad to have you here. And uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Alejandro uh, Calixto. He is our new director for the New York State IPM program, and he's leading our efforts to develop and provide IPM tools for agriculture and uh, urban communities, protecting pollinators, and assessing pesticide risk. He earned his doctorate from Texas A&M University's Department of Entomology and has over 20 years of combined experience working within the land-grant universities and, and the private sector. So Alejandro, um, we will have you get started today. Hey, good morning. Uh, thank you, Joellen. And uh, welcome uh, again. Uh, thank you, uh, each one of you, uh, for taking the time and, and joining the annual IPM conference. Uh, I just want to say first uh, that I'm really, really happy and, and we can't thank you enough for uh, just joining us today. Uh, we, we're living under a really unprecedented situation. Uh, each one of you dealing with your families, uh, your your kids, uh, your work, uh, and dealing with this pandemic. So uh, for you to take the time and, and spend half a day today and half a day next week, it, it means a lot to us. So uh, IPM is, is a, a very important program in the state. Uh, so uh, we, we uh, appreciate your, your support. Uh, and the time they're putting uh, for joining this conference today. So I'm gonna start uh, sharing uh, my screen. And uh, I'm probably just gonna turn off my camera. Uh, as you would imagine, the internet is getting pretty busy these days, so I don't wanna get interrupted uh, or knocked down in the middle of my presentation. So I'm gonna stop the video camera and uh, let me know if uh, if he's coming through. Looks good. Okay, so we're good to go. So uh, first of all, I wanna I wanna recognize uh, our uh, community IPM group. Uh, they you can't imagine how much time and effort has been going uh, behind these uh, for putting these together. Uh, this is our uh, first virtual IPM conference. 
uh, like each one of you, we were kind of embracing the uncertainty. Uh, so a lot of efforts, a lot of planning, and, and as uh, Joellen mentioned earlier, uh, we brought uh, Lean uh, Braben back from retirement, and he has done a terrific job uh, just putting this uh, meeting together uh, along with the rest of the community IPM group. So, so thank you. Uh, I just want to recognize uh, all their, their hard work uh, for making this possible today. Uh, I just want to go really quickly uh, over the program. Uh, as you all know, we uh, are uh, splitting the conference in two days. And, and again, we're just learning uh, about doing these uh, virtual conferences. And we thought that splitting the conference in two days was probably a good idea. Uh, many of us are spending countless of hours just sitting in front of the computer. So uh, we can't imagine how hard it would be for each one of you to be sitting in front of a computer for eight hours. So. So that was an executive decision and I hope it turns out to be okay. Uh, so the first, we're on the first day, uh, August 11th. Uh, we're gonna have about four hours uh, of, of the first uh, uh, section of the IPM conference. Uh, so I'm gonna give a, a quick uh, presentation about IPM and the IPM under the current uh, social environment. And then uh, we're gonna have our keynote speaker, Dr. Lorraine Maxwell, who is an emeritus professor for, from the College of Human Ecology. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Maxwell uh, joining us today to, get, to be our keynote speaker. Uh, then uh, we're gonna have a series of presentations, four presentations between uh, 9.30 and 10.50. Uh, and those, that block of presentations is gonna be about the status of IPM implementation within our schools. Uh, then we'll go for a break, a 15 minute break, and we'll rejoin at 11.05 uh, for a panel discussion. And uh, we'll be wrapping up around 12.15. And again, we'll, we look forward to see you again a, a week uh, from now. Uh, the registration starts again at eight o'clock. Uh, on Tuesday, August 18th. So uh, the, the presentation I have for, 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 for you today uh, is uh, about perceptions of IPM and today's uh, social climate. Uh, this is the outline of uh, the presentation. Uh, I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes just talking about the history of IPM. I think this is a, a really important time in, in, our, in our history to to go back and see uh, where we were coming from. And then I'm just gonna uh, spend uh, another couple of minutes talking about what is and what is not IPM. Then I'm just gonna focus on the state of IPM, the challenges and opportunities that we're facing. And then uh, I'm just gonna uh, wrap up just talking about uh, how important diversity is uh, for IPM. That's a, that's a strength for us that we have to, to use uh, moving forward. So a little bit about the history of IPM and uh, uh, there's been many practices that have been recorded in history about something that is uh, done towards protecting a crop or protecting the, the areas where you live. And the earliest uh, recollection that we have in history was about 2,500 years before Christ uh, where uh, Sumerians uh, were using sulfur uh, compounds to kill pests. That's the first uh, record that we have of humans uh, using some sort of tools uh, for managing a pest that was affecting uh, their, their life. Then uh, we go into a period and the Chinese, they play a very important role in, in, in just trying some new things to protect their crops. And, and this is one of the, the coolest ones and probably one, one that, I, that I like the most because I used to work with ants uh, when I was uh, working in Texas with fire ants. And the first record of biological control in history that, that, that we are aware of uh, was from the Chinese uh, back uh, 300 years before Christ when they were using uh, ants as biological control agents in citrus orchards. And that was a pretty nice uh, history. And I encourage you to, to just go online and, and read a little bit more about that because they were using bamboo sticks to connect the trees and allow the ants to move from one tree to another. 
and the ants were just pretty much being predators of one of the key pests that that was bad uh, back in those days. And then uh, they went into a period uh, globally where there were some uh, people were finding uses from plants and tobacco is one of the best examples uh, back in the 1600s where tobacco and another plant derived compounds were used as controlling pests. And then uh, uh, we went through this critical period, uh, the 1800s, and that's when we see that bloom of uh, people coming from Europe uh, and moving all around the world. And there was a big movement of, of different pests, not only insects, pathogens, but also vertebrates. And that was kind of the bloom of, of problems uh, around many areas, in agricultural areas, in, in areas where people were living. Then uh, we go into the 1900s, and I, I have this bubble here, 1939 in, in orange. And, and that's when DDT uh, was introduced uh, as a way to control uh, a pest. And that's the first recollection of a chemical use uh, for, for, for pest control. DDT is a very old compound. It was uh, uh, synthesized by a German student in, the 18, uh, in, in 1873, but it wasn't used until the Second War to protect German uh, soldiers uh, from uh, body lice. And DDT is claimed that it saved a lot of lives uh, during that period. After that, after the Second War, as you would imagine, there was a, a big revolution. After the Second War, uh, many industries started blooming and the chemical industry started blooming as well because they found, uh, they found use of many chemicals that were even used during the war, like organophosphates and carbamates, and including DDT, that uh, were found to have uh, some impact on, on different pests. And we went through that period that they, ironically is called the Green Revolution. So for the first time uh, in agriculture, people were able to use a chemical to control a pest and that was cheap. In the early 1900s, agriculture was very expensive. It was very hard and very, uh, very difficult to control uh, some pests uh, in different crops, but not until the 1950s is when you see that explosion of chemical use uh, in different crops. And of course, those were broad spectrum insecticides and, and they were uh, non-selective and, and harmful to the environment and, and humans. And then in 1962, that's why I put that bubble in green. We see that book uh, uh, written by uh, Rachel Carson, which I also encourage you to read if you have some time, is a silent spring. So we went through that uh, that uh, revolution, environmental revolution, where in that book, she pretty much opened up and said, you know, these uh, chemicals are harmful for the environment and for humans, and we have to do something about it. And then uh, in the 1970s, that it took about uh, eight to 10 years uh, for the U.S. government to step up and take some action. So the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, created for the first time uh, nationwide IPM programs. And that's when, for the first time, the IPM concept was mentioned. And that's the first time we see integrated pest management in history. Uh, the other thing that it was very important uh, back then is it, it was that Richard Nixon uh, created the EPA. And that was the time, the early 70s, when DDT was banned. The registration was canceled. Then we went into this growing period, the 1980s, where there was an increase of research uh, and, and extension efforts uh, on looking at different IPM alternatives, uh, different than uh, chemicals. So we, we see this uh, genetic revolution where there is a lot of uh, development at, at the level of the plant to, to protect the plant from different pests, insects, pathogens. We start seeing some genetically modified plants early, late in the 90s. And then in the 90s and the 2000s, we see this explosion of many, many tools that are coming right now. So we have the GMOs, we have an increase in adoption of biocontrol agents. Uh, there's a more, more, even more emphasis on softer pesticides and just to use them when they're needed. And of course, these technological uh, developments, the information technology, the precision and predictive uh, agriculture or precision and predictive IPM. 
and and everything is pretty much leading to looking in in, in to building ecological resilience so uh and when i said ecological resilience even if you're working in an agricultural system if you're working in your house or in your school what we're trying to build is a system that would prevent uh, pests to have an impact on humans and any of those either cultural practices biocontrol host plant resistant is towards that uh, building that ecological resistance. So I wanted to spend uh, some, some time uh, talking about that because it is important to know where we're coming from and because most of the time IPM is being linked to pesticide use and it's not. So moving into uh, what is IPM and there's a lot of definitions about IPM and, and this is one of, one of the ones that I like the most and uh, IPM is a sustainable science-based decision-making process that combines biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools to identify, manage, and reduce risk from pest and pest management tools and strategies in a way that minimizes overall economic health and environmental risk. And I have this triangle here, and, and you, some of you have seen this before, and this is kind of the IPM triangle. So you, the IPM triangle. So you have to start from the bottom up. Uh, so from the bottom, you always want to do prevention. So you always want to find the best way to prevent the pest to have an impact, either using cultural control, manipulating the landscape, a uh, host plant resistant, uh, using biological control. And you know, in, 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 in cases with schools and urban areas, the exclusion uh, uh, concept is a way of preventing pests. Once you start having issues, you move from prevention to intervention. And that's what we wanna prevent. We wanna get to that point that you have to intervene because when you go up to that point is when you have to start using pesticides. And that's the last thing we wanna do. And as you can see here on the right, you can see as you move from prevention uh, up to intervention, the toxicity increases and increases because at some point from moving from cultural practices up to using a, a pesticide, of course, there is a higher risk for the environment and for you to get exposed of a chemical. So what is not, what is not IPM? And this is something that I always struggle with people and friends of mine and even within my family when I ask, well, well tell me the first thing that comes to your mind when, when you think about IPM. And they always say, well, IPM is a way to kill pests using a pesticide. So that is not IPM. IPM is not an approach to manage pests using only pesticides. And please remember, pesticides are only used in programs when no effective alternatives are available or alternatives are not sufficient to keep pest populations from reaching damaging levels. So, so I'm sorry, Alejandro, this is Joellen. Hi, Joellen. So just trying to keep um, on time. Can I ask yeah. you to wrap it up in a couple of minutes? Absolutely, absolutely. So just moving quick into challenges. So a few of the challenges that we have right now is, uh, of course, climate change. Uh, Anytime you, you change uh, the environment, there's uh, uh, some responses on our organisms. So that is really changing the structure. It's also uh, promoting the invasion, uh, promoting the establishment and the spread of some invasive species. There's a lot of public concern about IPM practices, the use of pesticides and the impact on the environment. Of course, a lack of understanding of IPM, a lack of incentives, and lack of trained workforce uh, coming uh, into IPM from public, pi private, and, and the government as well. Opportunities, we got a lot of opportunities. So community IPM-based programs, uh, more people are, sustainability initiatives where people are more concerned about how the food is being produced and, and the impact on the environment and consumers. Uh, the digital technology, predictive and precision IPM, Successful integration of different tools, including biopesticides. There's some new uh, generation of chemicals that are coming into the market that are softer. And of course, educating a new generation of IPM citizens like you towards building ecological resilience. 
And right now, of course, using social media and all these uh, web-based tools that we're gonna be using for, for a while. And I just wanna wrap up this presentation with this last thought about using, thinking about diversity as a strength for IPM. So think uh, of our communities, the places that you live, we, uh, we come in from diff different backgrounds, different ethnicities, cultures, religion, economic status, educational backgrounds. Many of us uh, are often on front, uh, on front of the line of pest problems uh, in farms, in restaurants, schools, landscaping operations, universities, schools. So we need to create respectful relationships that can, can be foundational uh, for uh, for developing outreach about pest management and IPM. And it, it is important to move forward looking uh, at a cultural diversity as a strength uh, from which we can draw from for uh, pest management. So think about that, keep, keep we're a diverse uh, generation and diversity like, you know, like ecological resilience is the same thing. As we move forward together, we will be able to develop better IPM practices and have better adoption. So I'm, I'm just gonna stop here. Uh, uh, and uh, again, I just wanna thank you for uh, taking the time to, to uh, join us uh, this morning. And uh, please visit us online. We have a presence in YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, and, and Flickr. So, uh, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Alejandro. We really appreciate that, that introduction to IPM. And uh, later on in the panel discussion, uh, we'll probably be able to get back into more details if, if people have questions about that.